CEO Bob Iger and his puppet board at the Walt Disney Company are trying to fend off a proxy war from places like Tryon with Nelson Peltz, former CFO Jay Rusulo, and Ike Perlmutter, along with others like Blackwell's, with reports like this to shareholders that are chock full of information. The question is, is this information truly genuine? Is this information complete? Or is this a bit of selective accounting by the Walt Disney Company to uh, <clears throat> buff the numbers? One thing for sure is that the Walt Disney Company wanted exactly the kind of headlines from this questionable report from places like this, discussing films suggesting that Disney has made $12 billion from Star Wars, earned back almost three times what they bought the franchise for at just over $4 billion. But hey, folks, like we always do here, we put the Hollywood and entertainment industry through the business and financial lens of reality, and something tells me the fine print has the information that we need. Maybe it's time for Disney to stop gaslighting investors on stuff like this and start owning up to some of the mistakes they've made. It's the only course forward to correct the problems they've created. And now that Disney has had its chance to talk about things like Marvel and Pixar and Star Wars, well, now it's my turn. And I invite Disney to respond to this video if they dare. Yep, Disney has selectively edited their accounting. They've selectively edited their CapEx or capital expenditures. They've selectively edited the revenues from the Lucasfilm purchase and the subsequent Star Wars products to come up with this number. Welcome back, folks. It's another great day here at Valiant Renegade. It's good to see everybody out there once again. And if you are like one of the many watching this video, not yet subscribed to this channel, please take a moment and turn that little red subscribe button to gray. Hit that like button. Hit that notification bell. Share this sucker out on the social medias. And of course, please do leave a comment before you head out the door today. Make sure to join us every Sunday afternoon at 6 p.m. Eastern right here on Valiant Renegade for the live show. So it all started with a recent defense that was mounted by the Walt Disney Company board and CEO Bob Iger. Came out on March 11th, a few days ago. The right board, the right strategy. Disney's plan for shareholder value creation. All of this is in defense against people like Nelson Peltz, former Disney CFO Jay Rusulo, and Ike Perlmutter's some roughly two and a half to three billion dollars worth of Walt Disney Company shares. And as I keep wondering, if Peltz and Tryon were not making some serious waves out there, why would Disney even be bothering drawing attention to this? They're really focusing on Tryon and not so much or even at all focusing on Blackwells. It should tell you a lot. But the crux of the data that was pushed out in various social media platforms came from this slide in this investor presentation here, enduring franchises highlight our powerful intellectual property and unique monetization capabilities. And they go down the list here with Frozen, Toy Story, Avengers, and Star Wars. And in particular with Star Wars, they give us a figure of 2.9x or 2.9 times as they show here upline as a total return on investment, or TSR, total shareholder return. The problem, of course, is the fine print. Down at the very bottom is a section that I've highlighted in blue on the screen, and it's very difficult to read, even on the slide itself, without an immense amount of magnification, but it just so happens I've copied and pasted it to make it a bit easier. The total shareholder return, as they discuss for these properties, reflects the ratio between revenue and investment on titles released following Disney's acquisition of the IP. Now, right off the bat, I found this a bit weird because Disney didn't acquire Frozen, but it goes on to say that the revenue reflects 
an aggregate 10-year revenue stream, both generated and expected. So in other words, there is a great deal of assumption here on the part of Disney. Think for a moment for the rise of Skywalker, or as I call it, the rise of Palpatine. That's only been five years removed, less than five years removed, in fact, from theatrical distribution. That movie went straight to Disney+. Plus. They're still assuming another five years of revenue from mm, somewhere. And those generated and expected revenues are directly associated theatrical releases, including theatrical, home entertainment of those theatrical releases, TV, pay and free, and consumer products. It does not include derivative revenue streams such as park attractions, nor does it include DTC or Disney Plus originals associated with those franchises or pre-established franchise consumer products revenue. Meaning, for instance, like, I don't know, OG George Lucas Star Wars. Investment reflects film production costs and P&A, print and advertising or global marketing, folks, associated with the theatrical release of the titles. And in the case of animated titles, it also includes production overhead. Investment does not include any additional distribution costs or overhead. So right off the bat, wrap your head around this. The fact of the matter is, is that the Star Wars element, the Marvel element, even the Pixar Toy Story element and the Frozen element would not include anything that they spent to build attractions in the parks. What does that mean for Star Wars specifically? It would not include the roughly $2.5 billion that Disney spent to build out two Galaxy's Edge theme parks along with one failed Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. And also, according to the data, it would not include the nearly $2 billion that Disney has also spent, in addition to that $2.5 billion, on making 10 Disney Plus shows, three seasons of The Mandalorian, three seasons of The Bad Batch, a season of Clone Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi, The Book of Boba Fett, and how about the Whopper, the $250 million Andor show? Now, none of that is actually included because Disney probably can't find enough attributable revenue towards those pieces of IP CapEx to justify the figures they're giving us in this report. What's really funny is when it comes to Star Wars here, what's actually in the logo? Well, it's the Mandalorian and Grogu. Yep, it's one of the very pieces of Disney Star Wars that is, by their own verbiage in the footnotes, expressly excluded from what their return is being suggested. Except for the fact that they are at least suggesting that they are including the merchandise sales from The Mandalorian and Grogu in this. Just not the production and marketing costs of the TV shows that drove them. By the way, Here's another little tidbit. When it comes to the Star Wars franchise they list on there, this is where the $12 billion figure came from. Now, as far as the $12 billion figure, discussing film made a very simple mathematical calculation, which is exactly what Disney was counting on people like them to do. And that is to say $4.05 billion to buy it, and then 2.9x TSR, well, we get to about $12 billion. 4.05 billion times roughly three. The problem with that, of course, is that, well, Star Wars itself didn't really cost $4 billion, even though we like to throw that out there. That being said, I'm not Disney, and I'm not making an SEC-filed investor report. The reality is, is that the Walt Disney Company paid $4.05 billion for Lucasfilm, which included things like Star Wars. It also included franchises and intellectual properties like Indiana Jones. I think we all know what happened with the Dial of Destiny. That was a huge loss for the Walt Disney Company. Hey, how about Willow? How much money did they spend on that mess on Disney Plus? Or it gets even better. What was the actual value attributed in that $4 billion purchase price to successful business enterprises under the Lucasfilm banner, like Industrial Lights and Magic, 
and Skywalker Sound. One has to wonder that at least a billion dollars, if not a billion and a half, or maybe even two billion dollars of Lucasfilm may have been attributed to the value in enterprises not named Star Wars. If you think I'm being too critical, well, there's other examples of this on the very same page. Take a look at Toy Story and the Avengers. What is the initial guttural reaction to seeing those images and those names on the screen? Well, it's designed to give you the opinion of it's all of Pixar and all of Marvel, except, of course, it's not. Look at the Avengers for a moment. It's just the Avengers movies, according to the footnotes. The Avengers franchise only includes the Avengers, Age of Ultron, Infinity War, and Endgame. Why would the Walt Disney Company selectively only pick those four films? Because they could say the Avengers on the slide and not Marvel. If they said Marvel, they'd have to include 20-something other films besides the Avengers which would also mean phases four and five, which have been absolute disasters as we've covered over and over. Once again, Disney is doing some very highly selective accounting here to make people think that things at Disney and Marvel are far better than they really are. So if Disney is hanging their entire total shareholder return on Star Wars with the five theatrical releases, well, by all means. Let's take a walk down memory lane from a video I did several months ago. The Star Wars films that Disney produced, all five of them, combined for $1.9 billion in net production costs after the film tax credits in the UK that does not include any marketing or global prints and ads. The total rentals back to Disney for those Star Wars films or the money that Disney actually received back from the theaters around the world for those five films came to a total of $2.84 billion. But again, the $1.9 billion figure did not include any marketing. There's easily another seven to $800 million on top of the $1.9 billion, which they would have spent to market the films. And that's a figure that Disney mentions in its own footnotes. So where's the rest of the money coming from in that case? Well, Disney must be assuming that all of this money is coming in from merchandising of Disney Star Wars. That seems a bit unlikely. Sure, we could try to attribute a couple of billion dollars there, especially after the first film or two, but things dwindled after that. And then when you add in things like The Mandalorian, well, maybe that perks it up. But one of the biggest tricks in the book is these expected returns that Disney has put out there. The Star Wars films are not actually generating any revenue anymore because they're all on Disney+. Plus. What we're talking about here that's driving this total shareholder return or one of the biggest components is Disney+, Plus swiping the credit card that's already nearly $15 billion in debt to pay licensing fees back to Disney. Yes, it's the same old trick. It's moving the $20 bill from the right pocket to the left pocket at Disney and saying, look, the movies made money. If Disney was actually licensing their content out from Star Wars and Marvel to places like Netflix or Amazon Prime like they did years ago, then we might be having a different conversation, but they're not. They have been dumped on Disney Plus in perpetuity, which means not only have a lot of the actual returns been generated from within Disney itself, but this additional expected return component on a 10-year timeline is also expected to be generated from within Disney itself. So the mounting losses at direct-to-consumer or Disney Plus is what is propping up with phantom revenue to the studios at Disney. And that's how they get these ridiculous total shareholder returns or ROI on this slide. This is straight up low rent gaslighting and we are not falling for it. And I hope nobody else will either. And again, if Disney wants to respond to this and actually offer us some genuine numbers on the totality of the capital expenditure or the CapEx that they've made for franchises under the Lucasfilm banner, under the Marvel banner and under the Pixar banner, including all of the recent failures that they've had in the last two or three years that they have deliberately omitted 
at least except apart from Lightyear, I'll be happy to take an honest look at this because the information that Disney is putting out there right now is simply anything but. Your move, Bob. Make sure you're subscribed to Valiant Renegade and join us every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live show.